the tips. So please welcome George uh, from Spark Strategy. I always worry when I get the rev up as to how I'm going to go at the end of that rev up, and I've had enough coffee, I think, to at least go marginally well this morning. So I just want to follow on something Helen said. Um, I probably get, I don't know, maybe an inquiry every day or two from somebody, hello, nice to see you again, um, from somebody who says, I'm thinking of starting something up. I'm thinking of doing something. Can I come and pick your brains? And there's a phrase that one of my mentors said to me many years ago, which I continue to use, and it's called, you just look at the person and say, 42 cups of coffee. <laughs> come back to me after you've had 42 cups of coffee with people, with any people, with targeted people. So to your point, planning gets you into paralysis very, very quickly if it's done too much. But it's also a little bit of a wall to taking that leap. So 42 cups of coffee quickly refines any idea that you might have. So thoroughly, you know, completely agree with you on that one. So the topic talks about sustainable business models and the four steps, and I could do the Anthony Robbins three steps to the powerful success criteria, and you'll be off and away. I'm not going to. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do this, and this is going to be quite practical. We're going to share with you our story about how we've done it and share with you some of the little stories some of our clients have done as well. So hopefully that'll, that'll be useful for you. Um, in order that I can tailor how I'm going to chat, I'm sorry if you've already done this before, can I get a show of hands as to how many people have not yet started their enterprise? Okay, good, so that's about 20% for those online. Can I get a sense for those that are in early stage, first couple of years? So that takes us probably up to about 50%, and those that are established or don't know. All right, good, nice balance. So I'll try and, I'll try and balance the content a little bit for, for all of us. And online, I'm assuming it's probably the same kind of spread. So, let me tell you a little bit about our business and our journey, and that might give you some frame as to why I'm saying what I'm saying. So, Spark Strategy started 20 years ago. We had no value proposition, no customers, no clear products, but a cocky young guy who figured he could do it better than his bosses. And we hit the market, and any kind of startup capital that we had was gone within about four months. And we got down to about $20 in the bank, and when I say we, by that stage, it was me and a couple of partners, but it was just me, and thought, actually, probably better get serious about this. What are we doing? Back then, we were not socially oriented. Back then, we were not profit purpose driven. Back then, we were, how on earth do we survive and how are we gonna make some money? So we spoke to some of the mentors that, we, that I had in my network and fundamentally, one of the things that was coming through was that one, we executed their strategy for them. And we thought, hang on a second, let's do some searching. Google wasn't quite so big 20 years ago, but let's do what we can and find out who else is doing strategy execution. Is that a niche that we can own? And it was. We found our niche, we created some products, and we grew. And we grew so much that I would say maybe 12 years later, we were asked to roll into one of the large accounting firms. And back then, we were purely a for-profit business. We were making good money, and I was desperately unhappy. I had the lonely leader thing going on, right? And we were making some very wealthy people wealthier. And we were kicking all the goals, and at the end of planning period, we were ticking off our objectives. But again, what are, what are we doing? Why am I in the lounge so much? For what? Why am I not spending time with my kids so much? For what? What's going on here? Right? So joined the big firm, thought that might be something different. Within 12 months, realized that's not us. And at about that time, I came, became involved in, hang on a second, business is a force for good. Hey, that's actually about right. Been through some circumstances, both personally and family, that it really opened up my eyes that the world is not always rosy and it isn't for very long <laughs> if you don't work at it. Um, so cut a long story short, came back out of the firm and worked really, really heavily to set ourselves up from the beginning as a B Corp. Now, show of hands please, who knows what a B Corp is? Okay, that's not everybody, which is interesting. So. Can I get a show of hands, sorry, sorry, there's a little bit of a show of hands for those online. Can I get a show of hands for those who consider themselves or want to be a social enterprise or social business? 
That's the majority. Okay, cool. Thoroughly look, at, look it up. B Corp, shorthand for Benefit Corporation. When you go through the, um, the audit to become a B Corp, you're, you commit to altering the outcomes, your constitution, such that your organisation is enshrined to deliver both profit, or not both, deliver profit, environmental return, great conditions for your team, and for community. You build in those four principles into how you design and run your, your business and your business model, right? So, we decided from the get-go, we are not going to be those strategy consultants that go and help people just make money. That's not what we're going to be. We're going to be here to do some good. And over the first six months, we didn't, um, we didn't so much, as you said, Helen, we didn't so much sit there and focus on our plan. We got out and talked to the social sector, trying to work out how. How can we use our business as a force for good? And in talking to them about their problems, our first product really emerged strongly, which is sustainable business models for not-for-profits. Now, just stop there, those of you who are aspiring. In that one sentence, what have I just done? I've defined our field of play really clearly. I've also, through this articulation of the problem, or the solution, I've talked about the problem. Sustainability in the not-for-profit sector, right? Sustainable business models for not-for-profits. We were there, we were ready to roll. So we've matured a little bit, and that's, that was maybe four or five years ago, or closer to five years ago. So let me tell you a little bit about us now. So Spark is a beliefs-based organisation. We believe that every social problem we face is solvable, and as a society, we choose not to. And we want to change that choice. We want to change the way our society operates together to solve the social problems that we can do. And we believe that each sector has a role in solving those social problems, but more importantly, working together to solve those problems. So what we've gone about doing is developing our theory of change and then working out how can we best help each sector individually and then how can we bring them together. Was that pretty clear? Well, I've said it a few times, but that's how you'll feel about what you do. You will feel like, actually, that just makes sense to my bones about what I do. And your sustainability will come from that. It will not come from a smart marketing campaign. It will not come from a smart product. It will not even come from really sexy funding and financing instruments. It'll come from somewhere deep down where you resonate with the problem that you're trying to solve. All right? That's where it comes from. So the very first thing about sustainable business models is that it is not about you. Get over yourself. It's about the problem you are trying to solve. Be that social or commercial, but I'm now about purpose-led. Purpose Once you latch onto the problem you're trying to solve and become about something other than you, you're a long way towards the first step towards sustainability. And again, with the enviro in the room, when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about the financial sustainability of an organisation, which I know has links to enviro, but that's just so I get clarity on language. So understanding your value proposition, as a lot of the management texts talk about, would be absolutely the first step. And I kid you not, we've, we've worked with over 200 not-for-profits in the last five years, consistently helping them to generate earned revenue so as to complement their programmatic and grant-based income. <coughs> so fundamentally, I think most of you would have known that the not-for-profit sector is getting squeezed by reduced government funding and philanthropy can't pick up the gap, right? Our role is to have them not try and compete harder or do a flaming logo on their website or do more campaigns. Our job is to help them look inside themselves and their partnerships, look for underutilised assets and try and see how can they get revenue from those underutilised assets. And that does not mean charging the beneficiary, right? It means finding another customer. So I'm kind of wandering around a little bit here because the story is as interesting as the method. And I'll get to the method. So, in working with these 200 not-for-profits, we've been very, very clear. Our method has improved, and the four steps of it I'll tell you and share with you for yourselves in a minute. Um, there is a real desire. The social sector is powerful. It is not about a bunch of people who couldn't get work elsewhere. It's a bunch of passionate, driven, highly competitive, and highly competent people trying to do great work. Right? So harness it. And by helping them understand their own strengths we move to another key component of the sustainable model. It's helping them believe in themselves and having the confidence to act. When you get to your own value proposition for your enterprise, and it's crystal clear and it makes a lot of sense, your confidence levels will go through the roof if they're not already there. 
because you'll just, it'll just feel right, it'll, you'll know it's right, and you'll see the market responding. So here we are, we, we decided to bootstrap when we came back out of the firm, we decided to bootstrap our business. We started it up with $20,000 of capital. That was our start, and it was myself and Felicity, and that was it. So we're a few years down the track now. Um, our top line is a few million dollars. We've got offices in Melbourne, Sydney and Darwin now. We just opened our Darwin practice. Um, and we've got products into each of the sectors that we think need to collaborate around social reform. We just had to, we're starting on our first own impact report. Um, don't get me started about impact measurement, but our first impact report. And we've calculated that we've provided over a million dollars of financial support to the social sector. I never would have thought that possible when I started four and a half years ago and I forgot chasing money. I never would have thought these outcomes would have happened. So again, as an, as an owner operator, stop chasing the cash and it'll come to you. Is another sort of philosophical kind of, yeah, George is getting his hippie on, but thoroughly. It's worked for us. So, um, a little bit, that was a little bit about us and, and our journey. I've just come back from delivering three speeches at the Social Enterprise World Forum in Christchurch. One was on experimentation and system reform. How do you get social systems to be reformed at the whole of system level? And the other was on impact measurement. And I was thinking about sustainable models because that's kind of where we live. And I was thinking about impact measurement. And I couldn't work out why I was asked to speak about impact measurement because I'm pretty vocal that I'm not a big fan. And I realised that I was the Dolly Dixit to stand up there and be the no, the no to three other pe presenters being the yes. Right. Um, but there's one thing about sustainability that you do need to be able to grab onto. And if it's not impact measurement, you still need to be able to look and say, how do I know what good looks like for me? And what does success look like? And what are my micro success steps exactly as you've said? How do I count success early and often? Right? Again, when I spoke about this at the conference, there was a room full of people, some practitioners were saying, no, 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 we've got to get a number. We've got to have $8 is my social return on investment. $8. What does that mean? I'm around to deliver 20, 20 more services and I can do 30 more next year and 40 more next year. Hey, that makes sense. Right? So a sustainable model that helps you to do more of the work that you want to do is a great measure. Do I do 20 more beds, 30 more beds, you know, five, five less youth suicide? Those are really great. $8 on every dollar spent doesn't make any sense to me. So when you start talking about sustainability and the truth dimension and what resonates and the value proposition, all those consulting words, have them tie back to a way of that you can look at for success for yourself that's meaningful and humanistic. And you will mobilise your team in a way that I've been privileged to see with my team. Okay? All right. That was a little bit free form, and I know we've got to get down to some practical stuff. So I might just start talking about a little bit of method here. Um, I'm ha quite happy. Does anyone have any questions on that bit so far? And I don't have the little green box to throw at people. No? All right. Okay, let's start. So, <clears throat> sustainable business model. One of the key things that we've got to look at when you're looking at your own sustainability, I said, is being outward focused. But secondly, don't think of this as a financial model. Sustainability is not just financial. Okay? It goes beyond that. It goes, beyond, it goes into your culture, it goes into your assets, it goes into your, the very way in which that you believe and value and run your, run your organisation. So if somebody says to me, I want a sustainable financial model, you say, okay, there's Excel, come back later. The business model wraps all of it. And I'm happy if you want to use tools like the Canvas to map your business model, but this is the language you've got to be talking in, not just income statements, profit and loss balance sheets and, and cash flow projections. So what is, first of all, let's talk about sustainability. In our world, what we mean here is how do I get to the point where I know that I'm not relying on programmatic or grant-based income for my organisation to prosper? I have self-determination. 
here. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have those other income streams, it just means you don't rely on them. Now, as a social enterprise starting up, you probably, you might be raising capital. That, the sustainability conversation for you is going to be about how am I not dependent on continual raisings? More so, how am I not, not dependent on continually going out with my club and clubbing the nearest animal and dragging it back to my cave and skinning it? Right? How, do, how does a sense of momentum get created around my organisation that means that fee payers, customers, start coming to you? That you start just being as part of an ecosystem where business just flows to you and from you to your network. Okay? That's what I mean by sustainability. And you're going to have to go through a few stages to get there. Second conversation I want to have is, I'm not big on definition, so I'm going to use terms interchangeably, so please forgive me. I'm already doing a mea culpa. I use social enterprise and social business pretty well interchangeably, and I'm moving towards a, a phrase which sounds like purpose-led business, because that's more encompassing, but then I get told off for that. So, um, actually I got told off most recently in a forum which has just caused me to remember that I forgot to do something right up the front of this. So apologies, I'm going to do something that's going to seem a little bit out of, out of whack. I'd just like to acknowledge the elders on the land in which we meet, past, present and future. Apologies for taking so long to do that. So, let's cycle back around. Not much about definitions. The only thing that I do want you to think about for your organisation is um, Cheryl Kerner has a really nice definition that I do like, social enterprise. These organisations are funded, uh, sorry, are founded based on usually social premises. They're set up to achieve a social outcome. They're not necessarily set up to go big. And when put under stress, they fall back to these social norms, the way in which they're run. Social businesses are not constructed that way. Social businesses are set up and typically built to go big. And when put under pressure, they typically fall back to business practice. Will I trade off dollars versus purpose? Now, it's an arbitrary one, but I kind of like elements of it. So from your perspective, number one, when you're looking at your sustainability and you're looking at your value proposition, be honest with yourself. Am I here to make money and do a little bit of good on the side? Or am I here to do good and money kind of helps me to do it? And be honest. Be honest with your market. Be honest with yourself. Because that'll, that'll really enhance your value proposition. Secondly, if you think that saying to the market, I will give 10 cents in every dollar that I earn in charity means you're a social enterprise, wrong. Not good enough. That's just a giving program. Fundamentally have to rethink your value proposition so that embedded inside it is purpose, drive, as well as income for you to claim social, social orientation, is my view. So get that sort of thing sorted out and then be honest to it. And I'm not going to judge you. The person next to you is not going to judge you. Just pick the one you want and go with it. So we're talking about value proposition. We're talking about preparing to think about how do I become sustainable. So I would kid you not, in about 80% of the times I go and talk to CEOs, leaders, board members of larger organisations, established ones, but 80% of the time, they cannot articulate to me what their value proposition is, what problem they exist to solve is. If I was to pick on anyone in the audience, oh, now everyone starts to wake up, and ask me to tell them, tell me what their value proposition, what problem they exist to solve is, I think you would kind of, many, many people stop. Yet it's probably the single most important question for the sustainability of your organisation to be able to answer. Yeah? Who feels brave enough to be able to say, actually, I've got that nailed? Oh, no, no, I'm prepared to express it. Please. But I wouldn't say I've got it nailed. Sure. Thank you. And I, and I hope uh, people in online land understand I'm not saying I've got this nailed. Got it. Um, but I'm prepared to express it. Um, I'm a board member of Dear Dyslexic. Yep. And uh, the problem that we're trying to solve is for people um, age 16 and over to be able to reach their full potential. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, enhancing um, 
the one wonderful things that dyslexia brings to you, mm. as well as overcoming the barriers that dyslexia brings with it. Indeed. So that's the problem you're trying to solve. Mm. So the value proposition of the organisation? I thought the value proposition uh, was the problem you're trying to solve. Right. And thank you for that, because that willingness to share gives me a great example to be able to talk, talk to everybody around. So that, that clarity on the problem is the, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest starting points. So terrific that you've got it. But I would probably guarantee, especially in a social context, that not one organisation can solve every aspect of the comorbidities or co-dependencies co of problems that are around each social issue. Yeah? So reaching full potential, for example, we've worked with deaf children in Australia, and that's also one of their things. How do we get deaf children to reach their full potential? It's a really big territory. It's huge. And my sense would be the value proposition is that you pick a part of that territory that your organisation is going to focus on, part of the social problem, and that's, that's where you nail. Yeah? So that's the difference between the problem. So the problem gives you the first paddock, the value proposition narrows the paddock down to a corner of the paddock in which you're going to play. Is this helping? Yeah, okay. So be very specific about your field of play and link it to the problem you're trying to solve. Now the problem might be a commercial one for some of you, you know, and that's fine. Just be very clear about the two, di two different things. So the first stage, there are four stages that we go through in designing and thinking about sustainable business models. I'm going to give them to you now and we're working through the first. The first is set the right value proposition and objectives. That's going to sound so ordinary, you didn't need to come here to me to hear that. But that's the first one. And there's some techniques which you can do which make that work. Oops. The second one is put your innovation ideation hat on and park the strategic, the traditional strategic tools. So it's an ideation step. The third step is what we call stress testing. This is now where you bring the tools back in and you use them rather than insights tools, you use them to stress test your ideas. And the fourth stage is plan out your activity, your action plan. So set objectives, ideas, stress test, action plan. There's a fundamental shift in this thinking away from normal strategic planning. Strategic planning often, for those of you who've been on strategic planning weekends, you probably would have been drilled into submission, please stop, please make it go away, when doing SWOT and pestle analysis and porters and butcher's paper and sticky notes and please can someone make it stop. All right, now I love those tools. But this thinking about sustainability requires that we use those tools in a very precise way. And it is not to go wandering aimlessly into my external environment to see if there's an insight that I can then you know, monetize. How undirected is that? But for those of you who know Pestle analysis and Porter's analysis, they're tools that help you analyze your environment. If you turn around and say, I'm going to take an idea, a specific idea, and then I'm going to use those tools to crunch the idea, it makes a lot more sense. I'm not wandering off into what's politically going to happen in five years' time to try and find an insight. What I am saying is, hey, I've got this idea to do this community or this intervention. What in the political domain in five years' time could help or hurt me? To see the difference? I'm not wandering off hoping that politics will tell me something, but I'm saying how can politics help or hurt in five years? So, first of all, objective setting. Second of all, ideation, to give me my idea. Third, let's use all the old tools to, to break my idea. And then let's use financial modelling to do that too. And then fourth, if, if something survives the, the, the stress testing, let's action it. Let's get it going. Where does research for you sort of sit within those four steps? Step two. There's two parts to research. Actually, I was probably a bit quick with that one. The first part is contextual research, yeah? And that involves lots more coffee and, in, and community engagement and all that kind of stuff. Co-design, all those sexy words that we're all you know, bowing to at the moment, there. But the second part of research is also, now that we have the idea and it seems to be a little bit more robust, what else is happening around the world in my ecosystem and how could those things enhance my idea? 
more, however, from an effort time, more in the first bit. In, in the, sorry, step number two. All right. So I'm just conscious of time. I'm going to have to get a little bit of a wiggle on if I'm going to share some stuff with you. So, um, objective setting, I'll give you a little tip. <coughs> Chill out is the tip. I don't think anyone in this room is sitting here saying, I'm going to own a 2,000 foot cruiser that's going to cruise the Croatian coast in 10 years' time. All right? When you start setting your objectives, the way that it's going to resonate to the team that you will attract, if you want a great team, it, these objectives are going to be humanistic objectives. I don't know many people, and especially millennials, that have got much interest in your financial targets. Now, you need them from a financial health and hygiene perspective, but don't start there. For those of you who have been in business a little while or in corporate land, often where you start is, what's my top line objective for next year? And I'm saying don't. Start somewhere else. Objectives. Second thing, balance scorecard. Now the balance scorecard, for those of you who know it, you're probably thinking, oh dear, here we go. For those of you who don't know it, just have a quick look. I'm not proposing that you use the balance scorecard in its traditional way, but it is a really nice, neat tool for you to organise the thinking about your objectives. The balance scorecard fundamentally says, what are my financial objectives? Yes. What are my customer and market facing objectives? What are my internal objectives? And then what, how am I going to grow and change over time? Right? That's actually quite a nice hierarchy to think about setting your objectives. Yeah? And I don't start with financial. I actually start with the customer one. Now in our world, we replace customer, so we add to customer with beneficiaries because they're two different groups. Yeah, so what's our beneficiary objectives? What's our customer objectives? Who are we gonna help? Who's gonna pay us? Yeah? And then if you can kind of conceptualize a grid in your head, the rows are those four, or four things and the columns are the periods that you wanna plan for. They don't have to be year one, year two, year three. They can be six months, then it could be 18 months, then it could be three years. It can be non-linear, can be hyperbolic, it doesn't really matter. But I'm suggesting don't look beyond three years. And if anything, have an action bias. Make them months. 60, 90 days, whatever. So that would be my thinking. So set your objectives in those terms. Once you fill that out, you're giving somebody a very clear picture of how the whole organisation is going to move, shuffle and shake towards where you want to be. Um, it's always really nice to also create a phrase or a sentence that people can hang on to that encapsulates all that without being cute with a little tagline. All right? So, objective setting set. Inside there, you need to talk about sustainable income. So I'm going to just park that for a second because I'll, I'll come back around to it. Let's talk about ideas. So I've just passionately spoken about you, letting creativity, letting conversation, letting engagement with the world come before analytics. And so this is the stage to do it. So for those of you who don't know, can I use that whiteboard or is that, yep? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to give you an example of one of the tools we use if I had a pen. Over there. I'm going to give you an example of one of the tools that we use as part of ideas generation, and we do this a lot with community engagement. Um, it's called the value discipline. Oops, sorry. Has anyone heard of the value discipline? I'll try and pivot the board a little so we can see over there. So, the value discipline fundamentally says an organization can provide or create value in two of three ways to its beneficiary or customer. It can be terrific at one, it can be okay at the second, but it can't do all three at one time. And it's represented as an inverted triangle. The top left, oh, and sorry, whenever you talk about value, you're talking about how the customer or beneficiary sees value in you, not what you think, not how good you are. All right? So, the first broad area is called innovation. So usually you, 
pitched in the top left of the inverted triangle. And the construct here is that people come to this organisation because they want the innovation that it brings. The newest, the sexiest, the sleekest, the fastest, the smallest, whatever it happens to be. The second reason, source of value, is customer intimacy. They come there because they come to this organisation because it's bespoke. It's just for me. What I get from them is exactly what I need. And they listen to me. And the third domain of value creation is typically down the bottom of the triangle, it's operational efficiency. And for those, hopefully, on the camera, you can see that. Operational efficiency. I go there because I don't care about it being custom. I just want a widget. Yep. I want it. I want it fast. I want it probably cheap. It's the same. I don't care. It's the same as everyone else's. It doesn't have to be different. Right. Now, this theory has been around since the early 80s. Didn't make it up. All we've done is bent the tool. So, let's talk about examples of organisations that might exist in each of these domains. Give me an example of an innovative organisation. Yeah. Apple. I've lost count. I seriously think we're over 200 workshops consecutively where that's the first company yeah. name that's come yeah. out there, right? Absolutely. I've started to hear Google pop up there a little bit now, but you're spot on. People go and to the Apple product because they think that it is innovative. That's why you go there. That's why you unnecessarily upgrade your phone. OK? So we've got the latest. It's cool. Customer intimate. Anyone got any ideas about companies or organisations that might be that? This always stumps people. Disney. Tell me how, how Disney. Mm -hmm. So their policies are, you know, within a park, you can't see another building, you can't see anything that works, that will lose you, so you're just so customer-focused. Yep, nice. That's a really nice example. I've got a really boring one, but I'm going to use your one in future. <laughs> it's usually like accountants and lawyers. Yep. Sit in the room with me or the Chesterfield couch with me and do this. Just, it's just for you. But I actually like that Disney one even better, so that's terrific. But we get a sense here. Customer is king, customer, customer primacy. Examples of operational efficiency? Ikea. McDonald's, Ikea, yep, absolutely. You got, you got that nailed. Now, let's talk about wolf and sheep's clothing. <laughs> who reckons, who pitches that they are customer facing, but they're really operationally effective? Catholic Church. Catholic Church, yeah, God, is that what? <laughs> Amazon, absolutely. Virgin Airlines. We're all about you as long as we get our yield management. Right? So we have to be careful as consumers that we're not getting marketed a proposition and getting delivered a different one. So in ideas, when you're generating ideas, talking to the 42 cups of coffee about your idea and getting a sense as to where they see it is absolutely pivotal because wherever you sit on this triangle will define your structure. It will define your maturity model in market. And let me explain that a little bit. If I turn around and say, um, we're an innovative organisation, your organisational structure on innovation will be typically a little bit more network based, right? We know that from basic organisational structural theory. If you are more like a factory in operational efficiency, your organisational structure is about process repeatability, minimising defects and deviances. So you'll be very hierarchical down here as an organisation. And if you're sitting over here in customer intimacy, your organisational structure will be much like a pyramid. Peak penetration with my customer, then a big back office to support all the different nuancing of customization along the way. So if your market is starting to tell you you know, let's just say you have your cups of coffee and you say, I've got this innovative new tech, tech platform, right? And you're positioning yourself here and you're starting to think about your organization's design here, but your customers turn around and say, yeah, but that might be nice, but I actually like it because it saves me five cents. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I like it because I, you're listening to me and I can put in my own comments into your tech platform. You're getting a different message from your market to maybe what you think you're putting out to your market. But more importantly, 
pivot the question around and say, let's just say dyslexia, right? Put the problem in the middle and ask your customers to say, if I'm taking this approach to realizing my potential in dyslexia, what would you do? What would you do about you know, solutions that come from this field? What would you do about solutions that come from customer? What would you do about things that can be just made efficient? And I bet you, if we took dyslexia, there'll be elements of that problem which are about removing systemic barriers to access, which is like operational efficiency. There'll be things up here about how do we work with dyslexic community, their carers and their families, right, better. And there'll be things about here about, actually, they've got a whole heap of stuff to bring to us because they've got to overcome problems that the broader community could really use. Is this kind of making sense? I'm using this tool to come up with ideas for what your organisation could be. More importantly, ideas for how you can generate revenue. Because we're talking about a sustainable business model this session. Yep. Okay. Again, just really conscious of time now. There are 62 tools that we know of that sit in this ideas phase, step number two, that can be used with and amongst your 42 cups of coffee, community engagement workshops, interviews, research, to try and extract ideas. And what will happen is at the end of that process, you'll come out with, and you know, we're humans. We, we, we love to think that we're rational, but we actually make decisions emotionally and then we post-rationalize with a whole bunch of logic, right? And we like to think, no, we were grown up because I made that decision based on the facts. That's not true. You made the decision based on your gut and the facts came afterward. <coughs> at the end of the ideas phase, your teams whether your team is just you and your partners, partner or your broader team, there will be candidate revenue lines that will come out of this, candidate just, um, opportunities for sustainability that will emerge as clear opportunities. Now, what would you think you do? Hey, I've got this great idea for this revenue line. We heard this, we heard that. If you, if you heard Helen talk before, if you heard me talk, you've got a couple of candidate ideas, what do you do now? Someone. Yeah, you stress test it. And one of the first things you do is go and talk to the market. Hey, do you like the idea of this? The next thing you do is also you do conceptual testing. So does everyone know the, the old tools, but they're great tools for this? Porters, Porters Five Forces. Okay, this is a tool where you look to analyze your industry. Who are my competitors, my suppliers, my employees? Um, sorry, my... Um, let me start that again. My substitutes, my new entrants, competitor suppliers, right, and customers. And you look at those five things and you go, how will each of those domains affect these great little ideas for revenue that we have? Right? Pestle analysis goes even broader. Talks about the world you cannot change, you can only be impacted by. And it asks you what's going to happen in the future in the political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal domains. And finally, get spreadsheet happy on your ideas. So by talking to the market, doing the analysis, doing your spreadsheet, you will come up with a view of, of those wonderful ideas that we had, only two or three are actually viable. Now your final stage, which is action planning, is how do I implement those two or three ideas? And that's, I don't need to tell you how to do action planning, guys. That's simply just getting real about what are we going to do first and last, and all the bits in the middle. Is that making sense? Now I had the lovely 10 minute card waving around in the background there. And I want to leave as much time for questions as, I, as we can. Um, but I'm also happy if there are no questions to keep talking about various tools that will help with ideation. So let's start with some questions and see, see if anyone's got me to go first. We do have one from online if no one wants to jump in straight away. Sure. Uh, so our quest question is from Ash Kayla who asks, I'm intrigued by the comment that building in giving to a business does not make it a social enterprise, or oh, building and giving to a business does not make it a social enterprise. What about businesses such as Thank You, where they are a commercial business but give their profits to help solve social problems in developing countries? Yeah, so thanks, Ash. Um, my, my comment quite clearly is here. Even if, I, if I've, because I think, I think I've heard Ash talk a couple of times recently, um, the, co the construct of thank you is essentially not necessarily about just I give five cents back in the dollar. It is there, it exists, and I think if you listen to him speak, it, one of the rationales for starting it was to solve social problems, and this was a mechanism to do it. So it's a question of intent, is my sense of it. 
So just be, uh, just be clear and true about that intent of why you're setting up and what you're trying to solve. Um, I work with a lot of not-for-profits uh, in the NDIS space yep. and helping them transition. And the triangle you've shown on the whiteboard talks about operational efficiency, which is obviously critical for yep. NDIS. But at the same time, the customer holds the money. So they want a service that's intimate. Yes. So is that triangle actually a, uh, a continuum or is they yep. you know, one, ex one extreme or the other? So how can an organisation be both operationally efficient but customer intimate at the same time? Thank you for asking. Yep. Um, so, yep, the triangle actually it has a lot more depth and I'm happy to share with you afterward and it's online as well. You exist along the boundaries of the triangle or inside its space. So you'll be, that's why I said you're good at two, not all three. So you might be, you might, customer intimacy is important in NDIS because it's consumer choice. And the problem that a lot of not-for-profits are facing is they are down in operational efficiency because they're being programmatically funded. They now need to move up into customer centric because it's customer driven care. So how do they make that transition between being a factory to being customer oriented? And they'll have to go on a journey which sees that value proposition move up that way. But lots of detail there. Caught in seven years. Um, I, following on from this question, I'm, I'm again um, related to the NDIS. Yeah. Um, there were, you were clearly kind of differentiating between um, beneficiaries and customers. customers. Yes. Now, obviously, under the NDIS, um, mm. they're not necessarily two separate categories. Correct. Would you agree that they're not mutually exclusive? I would agree there is no black and white in any of this. So the reason I differentiate between beneficiaries and customers is because one of the first objections in the transformation to this thinking is often from program leaders inside not-for-profits who say, you are not going to charge my, my beneficiary for anything. Mm. Stay away, you evil, money-hungry person. Right? So I make the linguistic difference between the two, but you're absolutely right. NDIS is a great example where there is a continuum, where sometimes it is actually individual directed care, or sometimes it is the carers directed care for the individual and in a personalised manner. The beneficiary actually, you know, in, in the, under the new system will need to use some of their funds to, to become a customer. Absolutely. Um, so, absolutely, point well made. Again, much like the value triangle, it's not a question of extremes, it's a question of where you sit on the continuum. And I did have another question, if I'm yeah, allowed. Please. Um, um, what would you say, you were talking about the value proposition, what would you say is the relationship between a company's mission statement and their value proposition? Oh, yeah. Oof. So, um, that's a really hard one. Mm -hmm. um, the value proposition is intrinsically tried to the, tied to the problem you solve. If you want to have a mission statement, I counsel that the mission statement be an, a, an articulation of what the end looks like blending between vision and mission, right? So what does good look like in achieving the value proposition? And that's the way I differentiate between the two. I'm not a big fan of vision and mission, quite frankly. I think they're nice, but I prefer a values-based set of narratives and conversations describing your organisation and the people that work there. Other questions? Well, either you're ready for a break Oh, quick, yep, yep. quick uh, thought. Um, well, as you were drawing the model, um, and it was interesting to me that uh, everybody said Apple, Google in the innovation space, but it occurs to me that if you're a great organisation that's going to be, um, everybody's going to put up in that innovative space, you're actually great at all three of those. I would, I, I would propose yeah. that, and the reason is Apple, operationally efficient, probably the best on the planet, customer inti intimacy, Maybe not, but then you think about the level of personalization in your device and everything else, and then innovation. I would actually say that they're possibly, we view them that way, but they're actually down the opposite end in operational efficiencies, what makes them amazing. Wolf in sheep's clothing, absolutely. And also the thing with Apple is it may be that their partner is operationally efficient. Possibly. Not necessarily them. So the whole proposition might need all three elements, but within your organization, pick, pick that part of the proposition that you can fulfill and partner off the bits you can't would be my response. Yep. Fantastic. Cool. Any more questions before we move to our next presenter? Well, thank you very much, George, All for right. taking Thanks the time. Thanks, everybody.